Hey, it's Norm from Tested.com. So we're here in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest, but we heard that on the University of Texas campus, there's one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. So I'm here with Dan Stanzion. You're the director of the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And is that true? You guys have one of the most advanced supercomputing clusters in the world? Yeah, we've had uh, several of the fastest machines in the world throughout the years, and our current machine, Stampede, um, has been active for about a year, year and a half now, and is still seventh in the world, debuted so, sixth about a year ago. What does that mean that when, you have, when you say you have the sixth most powerful supercomputing cluster? Yeah, so there's a benchmark we use to rank, not just we, but that we sort of use around the world to rank supercomputers that's at top500.org. It's a, uh, an old benchmark where we measure the speed at which a computer can solve a big system of linear equations and how many unknowns, and you scale it up. And so it's really a ranking of how fast you can do math with a decimal point, um, essentially, uh, on a machine. And so uh, we're at about a peak of between 9 and 10 petaflops right now, so 9 or 10 quadrillion operations per second. Now, um, compared to a, measure. <laughs> a desktop PC, how many, more power, how many times more powerful than a consumer computer is that? Um, so if you buy a high-end Intel server class chip, um, a single chip is probably 150 or 200 gigaflops, so 150 billion mm -hmm. um, operations per second. Uh, and we're talking sort about of petaflops. Yeah, so at this point, yeah, we're you know, on the order of a million times <laughs> uh, uh, that speed, or maybe 100,000 times that speed. We sort of, in supercomputing, we go a little faster than Moore's Law, you know, the law that says you double every two years in performance because we're also putting together more and more chips to make bigger and bigger machines. So in supercomputing, we tend to go up a factor of 1,000 um, about every 10 years. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so the very first petaflop in machine in the world was just uh, three or four years ago. And uh, just 10 years before that, we hit the first teraflop machine, a trillion operations per second. And in the late 80s was the first gigaflop machine. So we hit a billion about 25 years ago. And that's kind of where the desktop scale is now. So you can think of us as building the computers that are about 25 years ahead of what everybody ends up with in their desktops and laptops. That's very cool. A lot of people, mm -hmm. when they think about supercomputers, they maybe visualize, for example, the Cray computers, this, the circular system. But that's not how supercomputers mm -hmm. are designed these days. They're clusters or network computers. How do you go about designing a supercomputing cluster? And, and what are, what's the hardware that you look at? Yeah, that's very true. And Cray is still a player in supercomputing. But even their machines are more like clusters. Those big machines of old, the round ones that you think mm -hmm. about in a supercomputer were when we thought the best way to build supercomputers was to build um, custom silicon and custom circuits around that and really change the design of the chips. But as you know, there's now a huge commodity market in building server chips where billions and billions of dollars get pulled into the fab. Um, and we've really sort of reached the point where the return on investment in terms of the, the power that it takes to run a very fast chip doesn't pay off. So what we do instead is build lots and lots of slower chips that we gang together. Um, so we're increasing the amount of parallelism or the amount of concurrency that happens to the point where now we use hundreds of thousands of processors um, in a single machine oh, wow. um, to make them go fast. So the individual processors in a supercomputer aren't really faster, it's just the scale of them. Because we have so many, there's a few factors that go into the design. Um, one is how you connect them all together. Um, we want to have sort of balanced performance between all of those, you know, relatively pedestrian speed processors, but if you're going to spread a big computation across them, you need to essentially make things uh, synchronized. You need a very fast network between them. So that's a big part of the design is how you connect them together. And then you need to balance the I.O. performance. You need to have a file system that keeps up with it. So you're really sort of tweaking those factors, what kind of processors you use, how much you put into a single server, essentially, to balance them with the interconnect and the file system performance. So Dan, what kind of hardware is in Stampede? What kind of consumer hardware? Is it all CPUs, GPUs, server processors? So it's actually a mix. We tried to design Stampede to be really a comprehensive system to solve um, a whole bunch of different scientific needs that fit into it. So um, the core of the machine, it was integrated by Dell, and the processors are by Intel. So um, there's 6,400 servers, each of which have two Intel Xeon processors mm -hmm. in it. And that's sort of the base system that gets us about two quadrillion floating point operations of performance, two petaflops. The other seven and a half come from the Xeon Phi coprocessors, which are uh, a new technology from Intel that's uh, in many ways similar to GPU technology where we have 61 processor cores on a single chip. Massively it's on parallel. a big PCI card. Yep, very parallel, simpler circuits, and therefore more power efficient. Mm -hmm. Power is really driving um, how we move forward. And so we have one of those in every node, and some have two. We have about 7,000 of those cards to get us the other uh, wow. seven and a half petaflops of performance in the machine. And then we do have some GPUs in the system, which we use for both GPU computing 
and for uh, data analysis, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, and visualization. Taking all that data and not having to move it somewhere else to visualize it is really important. And then we have another subsystem of very large memory nodes um, to do certain kinds of computation that you can't split up in a distributed computing way. Uh, and then a very large file system where we have about 14 petabytes of scratch storage um, that we can read and write at about 150 gigabytes a second to try and keep up with all those processors. So then you said supercomputing doesn't follow Moore's law. You guys are way ahead of that, it advances faster. What is the upgrade step? What's next mm -hmm. for supercomputing after Stampede? Yes, yeah, so we don't follow Moore's law in that the, the chips we use do, obviously, that we're building the systems out of, but the systems also tend to get bigger. And that's actually one of our challenges going forward is each generation is taking a lot more power. Um, Ranger, our system that was a, a top five system in the world in 2008, um, used about two megawatts to get to uh, 500 teraflops of computation. Um, Stampede at 10 petaflops is also about six megawatts. Um, so it's 20 times faster, but triple the power. So we're getting more power efficient, thanks to Moore's Law, but we're getting bigger even faster than that. And so that's really driving things like GPUs and Xeon Phi and other new technologies um, to um, figure out how we can get more flops for less power, um, given that we're sort of fixed in the transistor power by Moore's Law. Um, so we do have some plans to upgrade Stampede, but really supercomputers like laptops, like desktops, have a pretty short lifespan. Um, every four or five years, um, you just replace it um, with another one. As we went from Ranger to Stampede, and there'll be a Stampede 2 or some other good Texas-sounding name um, in the 2018 <laughs> or so time frame. We will do a mid-course upgrade on Stampede towards the end of 2015. Um, where we'll put in the second generation of Xeon Phi processors into the machine um, and squeeze a, a few more petaflops out of the hardware that we have. Um, but then in 2017, Stampede will be retired and the next machine will come along. Moving toward exaflops. Yeah, pushing towards exaflops. Yeah, probably won't quite get to an exaflop in 2017, but um, probably a few hundred petaflops. And we see the first exaflop machine in the world will probably pop up 2019 or 2020 or so. Mm -hmm. oh, that's incredible. So with that much computing power, with petaflops of processing power, Mm -hmm. What can be done on Stampede? Are you mining bitcoins? Are you running Minecraft servers? What's we going really on? try not to mine any bitcoins. <laughs> um, th there's a, a whole bunch of applications uh, that run across the machine. So at TAC, we're a provider essentially to anybody doing open science in the United States. So um, we have users from about 350 colleges and universities plus a few dozen companies um, that make use of the machine. And anybody sort of funded to do publishable open research through federal dollars, through the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the USDA, the EPA, NASA, NOAA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have, as I mentioned, I think over 1,500 projects um, running on the machine right now. About 3,500 different scientists used the machine last year alone um, to run about two and a half million simulations. And those range from earthquake modeling, colliding black holes and astrophysics at the very large scale, climate modeling, to nanomaterials, microelectronics, things at the, the, the very small scale. We do biology at the genomics level, at the vaccines level, really across all fields of science and engineering at this point. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for giving us a better sense of what a supercomputer is, how it's designed, and what it can do. Uh, we're going to talk to your colleague, Kelly, uh, to learn about how that data is actually visualized and how scientists can interact with that data. Yeah, well, when you have a big supercomputer, we can produce just enormous volumes of data. And what Kelly will tell you about is how we interpret all that and make some sense out of it. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. So now I'm joined by Kelly Gaither, you're the Director of Visualization here at the TACC. Now you have one of the most amazing jobs in the world. We talked about supercomputers earlier, there's all that data, everything's being crunched, but scientists need a way to interact with yeah. that data. Yeah. And so your job is to figure out ways for scientists to interact, such as this giant display behind us. Tell me about your job. Yeah, so I, I am one of the luckiest people in the world. So I am a child of Star Trek from a very young age. In the 60s, I started watching Star Trek. So I'm on this eternal quest to create or recreate the holodeck, create mm -hmm. a real instantiation of the holodeck. But not for fun, it's N not for- Not for fun, no. This is, this is actually for real use. So in this particular lab, we have scientists, engineers, people from the humanities come in and they bring us their data and then we use several different means, several different displays to actually show them their data and hopefully get some information out of it. We're just taking advantage of the fact that we have this very high bandwidth, low latency channel to our brain through our eyes. Yeah, and, and when you're talking about data, humans, we're not very good at reading numbers and spreadsheets. And, and in old science fiction, that's how, on Star Trek, that's how Spock interacted with computers. But you, being a fan of Star Trek, can see like 
popular media also influences how you design these visualization systems. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So Minority Report, the movie that came out, it has inspired a lot of the ways that we interact with data. So we try to actually, you, you know what we try to do is do as much of a natural interaction with the data. We want to remove the barriers. Mm -hmm. So you're right, we are not very efficient at looking at numbers. Numbers are what computers do well. What computers don't do well is they don't do the analysis and the synthesis and the pattern matching that we do very well with our brains. So all we're trying to do is leverage existing capability, and if you want to think of it in the computer on our shoulders, mm -hmm. right? And we're trying to show people images so that you can really get an efficient way to get to the knowledge discovery or the information that's sort of trapped inside all those numbers. All right, Kelly, so when there are you know, a dozen or so of these decision makers and researchers running this exercise, what's the benefit of having not just the sheer number of pixels, but a screen that's this big? So imagine using one of these 30-inch monitors and having, I don't know, you don't have to get very many windows open before you get very confused, right? You're, you're shuffling back in between the windows. In an environment like this, the way we have it laid out is what we call a gallery format, and it allows us to make a direct comparison without, one thing our brain is not very efficient at doing is remembering detail from one window to another. Hmm. What we're very good at doing is doing a direct comparison between images that we see right next to each other. Yeah, juxtaposed or even aligned in some way. And that's the benefit of having a display like this. Plus it looks amazing. Yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's just one of the benefits. There are a multitude of ways that you could use this particular large format display. One thing to point out is that the monitors that you see here are just the monitors that people have on their desks. Yeah, it's like a Dell, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a Dell 30-inch monitor. So everything that we have in the lab, we want everything to be affordable and accessible for people to, to go out and sort of recreate. Mm -hmm. We put all of our information out on the web, so if people want to build this at home in their garage, they certainly can do that. We tell them how. I know what I'm doing next yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So it's 20 uh, Dell boxes. 40 NVIDIA Gamer Class cards. So okay. we've been able to leverage a lot of what's going on in the gaming community for our benefit, for the benefit of science, really. And then uh, 75 tiled displays, and we just put them together to, to look like one big giant desktop. And the application that you can see here is really a pandemic preparedness exercise. So we have a group of researchers here in, the, in integrative biology. The leader of that is Dr. Lauren Myers. So in 2009, in the state of Texas, we thought that there was gonna be a pretty big outbreak of the H1N1 virus. And about 100 years ago, there was a significant flu outbreak that killed thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, and they really sort of thought that in 2009, we were gonna see another instance of that. And that started an effort to do pandemic flu simulations, and it's sort of grown into a project that's funded by the Te Texas Department of State Health Services. And what they wanna do is really do pandemic exercises. So they come into the lab, it's, it's a web application that they can run in their offices, but it also extends here in the lab where they can do some number of preparedness exercises and preparedness simulations. So it's like if someone watches a zombie movie and they have that giant screen and the, the decision makers are watching that visualization, yeah. the spread, this is what you guys do yeah, in the real world. What, yeah, this is what we do. So the decision makers come in and they can do something as simple as closing down schools in areas where they see a flu outbreak coming and something as, as technically complicated is actually redistributing antivirals. And they can see re in real time with the simulation what kind of effect that that would have on the flu pandemics. Wow, and this is just, you know, it's just a cluster of computers and you've designed software to throw windows up here. That's correct. And have, have the researchers here, you know, put up YouTube videos or played games on this? Is that something that? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we do have gaming night in the lab, so you can't have a facility like this without all the gamers wanting to yeah. come in and use it. We have applications that range from science to engineering to the biological sciences. Humanities comes in. We've had people in radio, television, and film that create movies inside the lab. So we really want this to be a reconfigurable dynamic environment that people can come and be inspired in. You know, these guys are 2D screens and they're very effective. And a screen like Stallion is very effective in a gallery type format but we really are on a quest to sort of immerse ourselves back in three dimensions. So I started 
in computer science when virtual reality first came on board and it was maybe a little before its time. Mm -hmm. Giant satellites on your head. Yeah, giant satellites on your head. The head mounted displays mm -hmm. were so heavy you couldn't hold yeah. your neck up. But now we're getting so close. The technology is really getting good. Yeah, with Oculus Rift, you guys are even yeah. experimenting with that. And it's a consumer technology. That's right. But it helps, you know, people are using it for gaming or you know, watching right. movies, but you're thinking of ways that scientists can use it to interact with data. Absolutely. And in fact, we have a couple of projects going on with the Oculus Rift. So it is very lightweight, mm -hmm. very affordable. They cost on order of about $300. People can, or anybody can order them. Yeah. Anybody can actually build and order any of the components here in the lab. But we have a researcher, an English professor, in the uh, that's actually looking at, she's inspired by Jane Austen's writings. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to, she had a website that's called What Jane Saw. And it was all of the paintings from an English painter uh, back in the 1800s that inspired a lot of Jane Austen's writings. What we did was we took all of those paintings and tried to create the museum format and let people walk through and, and actually see what Jane saw at that time. That's, that's very cool. So I gotta ask as a, a futurist, how far are we away from that, that holodeck, from that stellar cartography lab? You know, when are scientists going to be able to interact with data in that Star Trek way? So I will say this, um, the, the cool piece about the holodeck was that you, you never felt like there were any barriers. You were completely immersed in the technology. You could talk to virtual humans and it was as if they were really there. Um, I don't know when we'll get to that piece, but I do think we are there as far as being able to have a 3D environment being able to immerse humans, being able to interact with it seamlessly, uh, we're years away. We're, we're not tens of years away from doing that. We're years away. I we're going to be doing that here. And it's piggybacking off of consumer technology Absolutely. and consumer software, video games, basically. Yeah. That is so cool. And it's open so people can actually, if they want to, build their own and, and use it at Absolutely. Home. And we take all of the knowledge that we gain in here and we put it back out into the public so anybody can do this. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, for showing us around this visualization lab and giving us a little glimpse into that Star Trek future that we all want. Well, that's it for here. Uh, we'll have more from South by Southwest and Austin, Texas, our trip here on Tesla.com. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Norm, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.